Hello and welcome to another interview with Just in Time Worlds and I'm speaking to Kathleen from Worlds Unending and they have just launched and successfully funded a Kickstarter and Kathleen don't you want to just tell us a little bit about that? I absolutely do, thank you. Uh, so it's called the Elven Renaissance and the idea is that what happens when a world that is timeless like the elves uh, suddenly isn't, begins to change. What happens? Why would there be an el a renaissance in the elven world? And what would drive that? And, and what's the good and the bad and the ugly around that kind of change? So it's just a whole new world, an entirely original world about where the elves come from and what happens when it begins to just go through all these different changes. And you'll be able to read more on the link shared below and hit the Kickstarter if you're interested in picking up a copy of this new setting. And we'll have an interview at some point where we explore the details of the world. Today, we're going to talk about fantasy foods and having food in your fantasy setting and what that can bring to your world building and your cultural exploration. Kathleen, this is one of your topics that you really love. So what in your mind does food bring to cultural building? You can start with a cuisine and you can build a whole world. If I have a culture and I say, hey, they're they're kind of a warm culture, but they have some mountains, you know, a bit like Persia, maybe a bit like Mexico. I can take elements of Persian and Mexican cuisines and what grows there naturally and I smash them together and I can get this kind of whole new set of things. But then there's all sorts of interesting questions that, that come out of that is how does food move? You know, do you only eat things that are very local? Or if you live in a world with magic, can you preserve food and move it? But then, then that drives trade. And who grows the food? And who owns the land that the food grows on? And what happens when people fight about what, you know, what land, who owns what land? And so you kind of, this little thing about just like, hey, you know, I have this dish and it has seven different ingredients and they each come from a different place. Suddenly you have to know about each of those different places and how the food moves and who the politicians are involved and like what happens, like what's the legal institutions that help resolve those kinds of things. So yeah, it's a, food can be this window into just all sorts of cultural, social, political, economic questions. If we think of our own world and our own history, what would you say is the most interesting dish associated with a culture that you've studied? that really told you something unexpected about that culture? Because I'm going to jump to, to an expected one first, right? So apple pie, I'm American, American is apple pie, which of course an apple pie doesn't come, right? That it was an English dish that we sort of borrowed, it tells you about the history, right? Of where America came from. Um, it's also, if, you, if you've ever had an American apple pie, or if you've not, it's a whole bunch of apples and a lot of sugar in between some pastry dough. It's simple, it's very rustic, usually a little too sweet for my personal taste. Um, but that's kind of how Americans see themselves. Or maybe that's not how we are, but that's how we want to be, right? This kind of simple, rustic, earthy. So that's that's sort of how we envision ourselves and our sort of zeitgeist. So it can tell you very expected things and, and reflect those things. But one of my favorite unexpected ones was I was living in Syria, uh, in a particular part of Syria, in the mountains in the north, they drank a lot of mete. Mete, if you don't know, is from South America. <laughs> So how the heck is it like a, it's, it was so common, it was a trope. If you'd see it in, in Syrian TV shows, and that was, if anyone was drinking mete, you knew they were meant to represent someone from the northern mountains of Syria. Like, what the heck is going on here? Um, and it was basically a whole bunch of, of Syrians had moved to sort of South America. And when they came back uh, and sort of there was, you know, to visit family, they brought mete drinking with them. And so it was this big sort of thing there. But what was funny is that in that, in that particular area of the mountains is where a lot of the Alawi population came from. And so at, what happened in TV representations and in media and political cartoons and things, anyone drinking mete came to represent the Alawi population. And then sometimes was then that was used as a metaphor for the government. So it's like drinking a South American drink means a rep, you know, representation for the Syrian government, which is sort of mind blowing as, as kind of how food moves and, and the associations it gets. If we look at a fantasy example, George R. R. Martin famously does a lot of food. And I mean a lot of food. <laughs> and to be completely honest, in the later books, I could definitely have done with less food and more plot. But <laughs> regardless, he uses food in, in part to show the difference between class. The nobility eat this 
in, in massive excess, the 77 courses at Joffrey's wedding, the poor people obviously don't have access to any of this. And that, that you see in the way that hot pie cooks the pies at the end of the crossroads and all those kinds of details. I guess, is that a thing from our history, from anthropology? Does it, does it work like that, that there's different class of foods? Absolutely. Uh, right. I mean, if you, if you think about, right, we talk about haute cuisine and things like that, right. That, that this idea of incredibly fancy meals are very different from, you know, what most of us eat every day or probably ever going to eat. Food is oftentimes it, you know, quite explicitly tied to demonstrations of wealth. Uh, in a lot of, a lot of societies being generous is seen as sort of a way to demonstrate your power that you have. If you have lots of money and power, you can afford to give a lot. And if you're stingy, being called stingy is actually an insult. Uh, and, and one of these sort of ways you can do this is by hosting really lavish meals. If you think about uh, potluck type things from sort of the, the, the Northwest Native Americans, right? It was, it was this idea that you would host these massive meals. Maybe people would you know, bring things along to it, but that's to help keep the balance. You can't have one person host everything. And so if you can throw a lavish party with a lot of food that's really expensive and hard to acquire and you know, hard to, to get to where you are, mm. it is absolutely a status symbol. Um, and it has been for pretty much everyone everywhere. I'm reminded of Dune and the water squeezings that were given to the poor people and how valuable that was in Dune's context. And I mean, that was water, not, but I mean, same difference, right? Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> um, very much time. Very, very much a wealth and status thing of the very rare resource of water. In terms of ceremonial food, how do you tie that into your ceremonies? What, what would you bring to like a wedding or a a ceremony of meditation, like the tea ceremonies of Japan and so on. It is, uh, food is such a large part of ceremonial things. Either what you do or what you don't eat, right? Fasting, not eating too, is, is a big part of a lot of these kinds of things. And I think this can be sort of a way to, to really sort of dig into a culture and sort of what it, it feels at different times. So if, if you think about, you know, during, you know, the spring, what kind of, you know, food related celebrations are you going to have in that moment, right? The fall harvest celebrations and, and sort of ceremonies and festivities around there. Um, but maybe, uh, so in, here's a sneak preview, in the Elven Renaissance, uh, we decided that the purple is the color of romance mm -hmm. and kind of love in all of its forms. So during, during weddings, they will have all sorts of foods that are purple or purple-ish. So kind of red wines, like, you know, Spain purple. Um, there's a lot of use of lavender in, in dishes. Um, and a lot of use of kind of violet flavor uh, in dishes. And so kind of thinking about, you know, how can you sort of tie this in, find some sort of unique way that there would be these things that are very representative that might have color and taste and sort of scent associations and how you can blend all of those things together. And don't forget scents too. So uh, I have this cookbook that's one of the oldest cookbooks or translation thereof um, ever written. And it was sort of a, as a formal cookbook, it was this ancient Syrian cookbook. And it's interesting because uh, there's a whole chapter on things like soaps and deodorants because the sort of scent piece was an essential part of a cuisine. They would have like the water, the scented water that you would dip your hands in to wash and sort of the perfumes that they would give you. And that was a whole part of an actual kind of, you know, formal course meal was that sensory, like the, the smell. You, you remind me of my research when I was researching into the Ethiopian coffee ritual. There's a couple of things that I that really caught my eye there. The one is that they use the sensory perception really well because they actually fry the beans right there as part of the ceremony. So you've got this roasting coffee smell that wafts through the whole area of the coffee ceremony. And then they grind the coffee beans, obviously using a mortar and pestle, um, and they carry the beans, the woman running the ceremony will, will carry the beans to every person in the coffee house or in the room having the coffee ceremony and will, and, and they will smell it. And they will also be served as accompanying this will be nuts and popcorn and dishes like that. And then they make the coffee in this special coffee pot. But what really caught my attention here is girls learn from their mothers to pour from this pot using holding the pot at waist height and letting the 
the coffee pour onto a table. So it's like a almost a meter of, you know, the stream heading into the cup without spilling. And that's like part of the whole skill of hosting the coffee ceremony, which I thought was just amazing. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing ceremony, the whole thing around it. And unlike the tea ceremony from Japan, which is very much focused around kind of meditation and clearing your head, the coffee ceremony is a very social ceremony. And it's all about passing time with friends and discussing non-important things during the ceremony. That's an interesting thing too, right? Is, is cultures and when you have meals and when you discuss business, mm. right? Because there are some uh, that you, you don't, you know, it's only social until you get to the end of a meal and then you can do business. Some it's, you know, the meal is when business happens and at the end that signals that you're done, your deal is made or not. So these kind of interesting ties of, of sort of, you know, how you use meals. In one of the worlds that, that I've built, uh, there's actually sort of a, a, a patron god of, of a particular type of food, savory food. Um, that is what business deals are done over. And so that God is also that has in, in his purview is, you know, things like business deals and agreements and arrangements, you know, so it's the, the savory pastries and business deals, but because those things are so aligned. As you said, it's very interesting how different cultures approach that kind of feeding concept, because so many cultures have got the concept of guest rights. So if you have fed somebody they are considered to be protected for some period of time because you have accepted them into your kind of household by feeding them. Yeah, the idea of breaking bread together that somehow binds you, right, mm. in, in a way. So in fantasy worlds, of course, you can have a lot of the same kinds of ceremonies and so on. But what about like actually doing the food? Like, picking ingredients and so on, you know, haunch roast of dragon. And <laughs> I, I love this. And there's a, there's been a surge in this and, and some of, there are all sorts of kind of fantasy cookbooks out there. And some of them are just normal dishes you would find in the world that just have a different name. But for me, when I make, I have, I have a whole personal cookbook of fantasy dishes. It is, I, I figure out what grows in a region, how they would move it, where it would likely to be, what kind of meal I'm making. Is it a big so, you know, X number of courses, formal meal, or is it, you know, what you eat when you pick something up on the way home? And, and then actually exploring that and, and putting flavors together that just you would never put together in this world. And you end up tasting things sometimes, you're like, well, that's very distinct. Like your, your brain just doesn't know how to process it, but it can be such a fun experience. And when you're role playing in particular, if you make it for your table, when you can play in person, it can really transport you, right? It has that, like, cause again, although you're bringing all these sensory inputs in, in a different way, and you can sort of take people to a different place. So I, I love doing it. And we do it at home. Um, we invented one culture where they have what we called it the wending. So it wends like a river. Rivers, rivers are very important in this culture. And so the idea is that you would have basically your buffet, it kind of wends around your house and you build your houses, in fact, to host exactly these kind of parties. And this is for only very rich people. But they, they also have, I pulled from sort of Ayurvedic tradition. So they have this idea of, you have to be perfectly balanced. So any meal that you serve to guests should be perfectly balanced. And they have something like a 16 point system of how different foods align. So first I had to go figure out what foods they had, how they aligned, like how the ingredients do. And they end up sort of throwing in lots of like ingredients into some dishes because you, they can absorb a little more like a meat dish, like all right, well, 17 different spices are going in there. But everything has to balance out. And so I did this, and I did it in our living room and, and I think I had 22 different courses um, of different kind of foods to, to balance this out. But it was great. Like, it was so much fun. It took forever to make. Um, but it was like, once you did it, and I had friends over and everyone got to kind of experience this. It was just, um, it was immersive in a way that, that nothing else is. And, you know, it was a lot of time and energy, but it was totally worth it. While you were speaking about like the balanced approach and so on, I was wondering, it would be interesting if you created a magic system where instead of preparing like a scroll or something like that, you prepared a food that you consumed and it then acted like a spell. So you would have the cupcakes of fireball, coffee of vanishing or <laughs> equivalent types of a, a food-based kind of magic system would be a very interesting thing, like baking the, you have to kind of prepare your spells by baking them the night before. That would be fun. And then, the, and then interesting questions of what happens if it, like, you left it sitting too long? What happens when it goes stale? Does the magic not work? 
if if somebody else steals your cupcakes and they eat it, can they just use it? Like, right? Or is it is it tailored to you, or does it go slightly awry? It's, 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 it, don't confuse them with your actual just cupcakes for guests. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, if you've added the fire component, don't mix in the. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would, and then you know you have to make all of those dishes, obviously. Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> I think one of the things that we spoke about as well, speaking of magic, is that so many fantasy magic systems do use the mage's energy in terms of powering the magic. That's quite often the power source is the mage's kind of internal energies, which I think should result in the mage burning a lot of calories every time he powers his magic. And there are some magic systems that are pretty explicit in that, in that the mage kind of burns, the, burns their calories as they go, which brings up the interesting point. Do mages kind of eat themselves half to death then, you know, trying to <laughs> kind of keep their uptake large enough? I actually played a, just wrapped up a campaign where I played a, a mage and she was sort of young and goofy and, and high metabolism anyway. But she was she was incredibly food made motivated. She was eating all the time. Like she would just she was constantly shoveling food in her face. And but she was really quite scrawny. For and that was exactly kind of internally that was my premise is that she's using yeah. magic all the time and she's kind of burning that energy and she she kind of had to and so of course her you know her her husband and her friends were like how do you this isn't like anyone else ate like you this just wouldn't work but other sort of mages understood. What's interesting there is also that those mages would presumably if they didn't want to continuously be eating they would presumably gravitate towards high calorie food types so a lot of starches a lot of I don't know if it'd be sugars because sugars burn fast but but like the slower burning starches I think would be very popular amongst majors in that kind of a system I wonder if you get interesting things that happen too, or, you know, if you, if you stop project, practicing magic, but you continue to eat like you still did because you don't think about it. Like this is where you start to see like the kind of overweight mages at the end because they just. <laughs> sumo, sumo wrestler type syndrome. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do believe that sumo wrestlers actually lose weight rapidly once they go off the circuit because eating as much as they do takes effort. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I, I was in Japan briefly and we stopped at a restaurant and there was, you know, sort of a local sumo wrestler came, came out and was happy, just happened to be lucky. Was, and it was just like, I, I like, he almost looked pained <laughs> trying to eat that much. And then I suppose food is quite often tied into healing. Yeah. Things like willow bark tea uh, to reduce kind of fever, because of course the active ingredient there is aspirin. Um, and before you have like chemical medication, a, a lot of a lot of your uh, remedies would be food based and good mm-hmm. old chicken soup for, <laughs> right, for everything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's still my go to. <laughs> yeah. And poison too, right? It goes both ways. The, the things yeah. that can things that make you feel better oftentimes can kill you too if in the the right doses. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That sort of tied to kind of the, the sort of land and, and, um, and just the, the kind of natural uses of that. And then, you know, think about how magic could enhance those, right? We have chemistry, but magic could absolutely mm-hmm. enhance any of those kinds of things. They take those, those same things, you reduce it down and suddenly you have a concentrated willow bark or, or whatever. That... Yeah. yeah, magic could take the place of, of kind of your science and extracting the active ingredient. You know, because, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what people did to a large extent with with uh, medication as they extract the active ingredient from the natural substances at least to start with people think about you know mages as being like people who throw fireballs and live in towers and you know but uh, you know th- there'd be an, a strong economic push i think in particular for there to be mages who were doing medicinal kinds of things like that who were uh, you know owning restaurants and pastry shops and making ridiculous things right like how do you get fizzy drinks in an air before you know easy carbonation uh you totally just have an air made put some bubbles in there why not um <laughs> and all of these things that i think that's what i'd be doing actually i always find that the trope of the mage in the tower only works if magic is super rare like if there's a few like seven eight nine people in all the world then sure you, you can have, you know, the mage in the tower. You can have the Gandalf type mage who actually isn't even human. It's, you know, fallen angel, 
Well, I suppose Gandalf isn't fallen, but you know what I mean. Descended. <laughs> yeah, descended angel. If you have magic as a fairly common thing, surely mages would be more interested in turning a profit. <laughs> Especially depending on what families they come from. If you come up from a family that owns a restaurant and you turn out with you know magic skills, you better believe you're helping to like stir the pots and like all these things. Yeah. You're going to figure out ways to, to do that even as a kid. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's one of the reasons why when I designed my magic system, I focused so heavily on kind of like just internal and the body modification and so on, because that meant that it basically it's just a thing you generally apply. I know myself. If I design a magic that is fundamentally external to myself, affecting like the world, then I'm going to have a whole freaking world with, you know, bakery shops and... <laughs> I mean, I want, to go, I want to go to that world, though. Let's be honest. <laughs> Someday I might design a world where I've got a different magic system and a very different world. In all of the fantasy settings that you've played in or designed or built, what was the one that, that you really love the most? So I think it's for the, this culture that I have a, that's called Maison. And this is the one that's kind of, it's a Persian-Mexican fusion. And I find that it's my favorite because it's there's a kind of rusticity to it as well. Um, there's There's kind of a... They, they use a lot of like a lot of spices and a lot of flavors, but the idea is to kind of blend them together. So if you think about kind of Indian cuisine a little bit, where you have a lot of spices, but you, you make something new out of a bunch of different things. It's kind of that philosophy versus kind of a sort of Japanese, you know, philosophy where every ingredient should sort of be its own thing that pops on its own, right? And those are kind of the two extremes of that. And so it's more that kind of, you know, sort of blended cuisine and a lot of, um, sort of just simple it's fairly easy to make a lot of grilling of things which is nice because that's pretty easy if I make it in the real world but it's you know they have they do have stylized courses a nine course meal is your sort of standard course meal and you have you know it starts with sort of and I borrowed this a little bit from Arabic culture where you know you start with like dried dates and, and kind of nuts as sort of your first course and then you progress through and you have different kinds of flatbreads and things like that and it's just it, it's nice because it's it's kind of very heartwarming sort of food Mm. Um, for me and one of the main ingredients they use I decided at one point was allspice which is kind of native to the sort of Central Americas and uh, I now don't use pepper in anything like black pepper I use allspice and it goes in sweet dishes and so say, even if I'm just making normal things for myself this is an ingredient that I use because it's some it's that's how they use it they use, it goes in everything and so that's just now something I've adopted it so my my husband now is just like it, does, does this have enough allspice in it? And he's, he's not even joking. He, he's like, it's, he's so acclimatized to it as well. I think that one of the most interesting food types that I've seen in fantasy was probably from um, Jane M. All. But that's just because her world was set in the pre agriculture. You know, it was a, a Neolithic world. So these people were hunter gatherers. So their methods of food preparation was so different you know because they'd like hunt with a sling say a grouse or a you know a, a mega fauna or a mega flora because that of course they were living in the ice age so it was all those kinds of things as well and then they would dig a oven in the earth to kind of cook the thing in and so on and that of course made the not the food itself but the food preparation like things like finding salt was actually quite a hard thing for them Unless you were close to the ocean, it was very hard to find salt. So they ended up, you know, adding radish to things and, and stopping to dig up wild radishes whenever they found them just for the kind of salty taste that they add and so on. So that was also a very interesting take because things that you would take for granted, like salt or, you know, various spices and so on. No. <laughs> I have a friend actually who similarly he's he's Native American and he has done he's a professor and has studied Native American cultures for a long time and so I asked him one point I said you know what do you know anything about Native American cuisine and he just kind of laughed and he said they didn't really use salt he's like so it's by our standards pretty bland <laughs> he said and there's I, I like that there's now a lot of sort of Native chefs that are finding ways to kind of bring back a lot of those ingredients but mm. kind of give them a modern twist. Uh, he's like, but he was like, yeah, he's like, when you have sort of really authentic stuff, he's like, it was not very exciting by the modern palate. <laughs> salt is an interesting thing. You can mine it. There are salt deposits that are mineable, but the miners go blind because of the way that it interacts with the air and, and your eyes. Eventually, 
um, if you mine salt, you go blind. That's why pre the industrial age, pre pre having machines and protective goggles and all of the things that we now have, salt mining was always done either by slaves or by criminal convicts who are who are carrying life sentences. It hmm. was you you could not attract free labor to come and work in a place that is a death sentence. I had no idea. That makes sense. It is the reason why I have slavery in the Kisangi continent, because they do mine salt. And a lot of the wealth is based around that that salt mining activities and some of their other mining activities. And you can't attract free labor to that kind of stuff. And yet salt is a key component of what we eat, not just in terms of taste, where, of course, salt makes a fundamental difference to so many things. But also, we need salt. And it's not something we often think about because salt is plentiful now. But Mm -hmm. it wasn't. There was a time when it was a very, very, very valuable commodity. Yeah. That's the thing I thought about much. So I I was in, we went to Peru and um, there's the sort of salt sort of flats that they have kind of that are very very old right where there's for whatever reason there's this mountain where salt water comes out which is you know a bit of an interesting mystery how up in the you know andes mountains there's this one where it's full of salt water but when it probably picks it up from the minerals come you know and then there's this aquifer and then they but they they have these just all these terraces where they've slowly they kind of build these little pools and then they dry out the salt um and it's it, you know it's fantastic stuff but it's this has been a problem for, you know, for, for pre-industrial societies for a long time. This is kind of many ways to, to find solutions. But yeah, I hadn't, really, I hadn't known about the blindness thing. Okay, so closing thoughts on fantasy and food. Do it. Um, if, you, if you've got your own world at all, or you even have you're borrowing someone else's world and it doesn't get into it, try it. Make your, you know, try your hand at it. Reach out. I, I happily consult on this all the time. Um, I have <laughs> just things everywhere. Um, I love making up new cuisines for myself and other folks. Uh, but yeah, try it, try it in a game. It, it just adds so much. And there's just so much. Suddenly you'll be asking questions like, yeah, where does the salt come from? Or all these little things that, that you wouldn't think to ask. And thank you very much for joining us for another interview. And I will see you soon for another episode.